Thank you very much for being there. It's a pleasure. Today we have our fourth webinar on this series of webinars. Um, the topic for today is planning for neutrality, considering land degradation neutrality in IH Basin integrated land use planning. So, as I just said, this is our fourth webinar. We started with the methodological framework for ELUP, which was recorded and uploaded uh, in our webpage. Then we had a, a webinar on GIS for land use planning and, and a, a demonstration using QGIS. Last time we had the introduction to Google Earth Engine and today we will focus on some indicators used in land degradation neutrality and considering this framework in ELU. Next time we will meet from for some digital soil mapping with our software. Oh, there is an E missing there, sorry for that. So we are about to finish with this series of webinars. So let's start with uh, today's uh, planned topics. We will start with an introduction to land degradation neutrality and its link to ELU. Then we will see more in detail which are these three indicators, change of state, state indicators. Then Cesar Garcia will give a demonstration, a, a live demonstration on using trends.earth, which is a, a tool, a, a QGIS plugin to calculate these indicators globally. And then we will focus more in, we will focus on land productivity dynamics and trends of uh, vegetation productivity as a, a, a very key indicator to map land degradation that can be used in land use planning. I see is, is the chat is, is all okay, Ailey? Should I stop to give place or I continue? They, they couldn't solve the problem. You can continue. Okay. You just let me know if I should stop okay so uh, i don't know how many of you are familiar with land degradation neutrality uh, this concept uh, is defined as a state where the amount and quality of land resources necessary to support ecosystem functions and services remain stable or increase this is why it is called neutrality because they either remain stable or even better, they increase, but they do not decrease within particular temporal and spatial scales. And LDN was uh, included as a target for, S for the Sustainable Development Goal 15, which is life on land, and it's target uh, number three. So SDG 15.3 is the target that refers uh, to land degradation neutrality. So we want to achieve land degradation neutrality by 2030. <clears throat> okay, and why is it important to link land degradation neutrality to land use planning? And what are we talking about this in this webinar? Well, the neutrality mechanism, which is this that I try to uh, uh, show here, is based on counterbalancing future losses that we can anticipate and future gains. And to achieve this, land use planning is key, is, is basic, because if, if you can anticipate when you are doing a land use planning, which are the places and areas in which you will lose your natural capital, where areas will be degraded, but you take this into account to anticipate possible gains, um, then you are doing a lot for achieving land degradation neutrality. So <clears throat> it's really important that land use planners are aware of this and try to consider it. Uh, because if not, it will be very difficult to achieve land degradation neutrality. So it, at which scale this neutrality mechanism needs to be um, thought of and achieved? Well, not uh, in general, but in a specific land types. So within unique land types. And what do we mean by this? Well, land types are defined as a class, so you, you, you classify your area and you take into account different variables. So it's a combination of edaphic, geomorphological, topographic, hydrological, biological and climate features. This is, of course, an exercise 
and uh, that is not easy to do. And but for for example, for IAS, we still we we have a lot of information available uh, that we could use to define these land use types. So here I'm taking this map as an example of a, a land use types. Actually, this is a, a land cover map. It, it, it's 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 not uh, derived from all of these variables, but we, can, we could think of it as an example of land use types. And let's have a very simple example to see what we mean by this neutrality mechanism. So let's think, for example, of grasslands as a land use type. Now here in this, in this map, these are grasslands, like they are maybe a bit different to distinguish. They are um, not light violet, but a bit brown. <clears throat> and let's imagine that when we are um, during the land use planning process, we can predict, we can uh, anticipate that 300 hectares will be converted from natural grasslands to agriculture. So what we need to do is to think of a way to counterbalancing this loss because a conversion from a natural grassland with more biodiversity can be considered a loss. So we can anticipate 300 hectares of loss. And we, think we need to think of a way to counterbalance this gain. And for example, we can decide that in some areas, for example, in this, this is a very illustrative example now, of course. In these 500 hectares, uh, sustainable grazing management will be introduced. And this would be a proposed gain to counterbalance the loss. So this is basically what we mean by neutrality mechanism, so that the, no net loss is achieved. However, it is important to also consider the magnitudes of these losses and gains, because it's not the same to, for example, <clears throat> deforestate, you, you cannot compensate deforestation by sustainable, um, by, 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 for example, sustainable forest management, because in, in maybe one thing has more magnitude than the other. So magnitude has also, also needs to be considered. Anyway, in this example, for example, direction, direction would, be, uh, would be okay, because in, we are counterbalancing gains with losses. This is a whole issue that needs to be discussed, of course, and considered for each area and each project, and sometimes you do what, what you can. The important thing is to, to have this framework in our minds when we are uh, doing uh, land use planning, so that we can anticipate and plan for not uh, losing natural capital. So this is what we have been just talking about. This figure, if you are uh, familiar with, with land degradation neutrality, is like a, a, the key um, figure to summarize what land degradation neutrality is. Uh, it's in the scientific framework for LDN. And this is the part that refers to the neutrality mechanism. As you can see, this is on top of this pyramid, which is the LDN response hierarchy. What do we mean by this? This is related to what I was just talking about. Um, LDN is, a way, is based on the fact that it's better to prevent than to cure. So <clears throat> it's always better to prevent and avoid land degradation. So this should be the pillar and the efforts should be uh, here in avoiding land degradation. The, the second um, part is reducing and this is related to sustainable land management practices. Um, in some areas we can introduce sustainable land management practices, sustainable forest management, sustainable grazing management and this way we can reduce degradation because the thing here is that we know that we will degrade land. We cannot, sometimes we cannot avoid it and we need to uh, counterbalance it by, for example, reducing the degradation. <clears throat> and last, we have reverse. And this is related to restoration and rehabilitation of land. And where um, 
before reversing, this is very costly and sometimes very difficult and actually it's almost impossible to restore an area to its uh, initial state if we are considering biodiversity, ecosystem, other ecosystem services, etc. So <clears throat> this, is num this is in the uh, top of the pyramid of this response hierarchy. So how do we do this? <clears throat> Sorry. How do we uh, integrate LDN in land use planning? Well, this is, there is no simple answer for this. I mean, actually, I wanted to show you that now this competition is being, it's open, it's been organized by um, the GEO LDN initiative and the UNCCD, and they are asking for teams to, to compete and to present ideas on actually how we can um, design a solution for land degradation neutrality using land use planning to, to make tools that can be integrated to this trends.earth um, software I was talking about to help decision makers to uh, include land, land degradation neutrality in ELUP. So this would be very interesting if any of you would like to enter the competition. It is still open until the end of September. There is a lot of information and, um, and ideas uh, are being welcomed by the UNCCD, for example. The neutrality mechanism based, anticipate and plan in the baseland and the monitoring indicators. And well, there is, we need a way to monitor what is going on and to report. And three indicators that were used for the UNCCD reporting were also chosen for the S, SDG. <laughs> I mixed the letters, SGD says. Um, and these are very three uh, global change of state indicators, which are land cover change, land productivity dynamics, and changes in soil organic carbon. These indicators uh, are not uh, additive and they are related to each other. And if we can map these things, and maybe we can use this also in land use planning. So let's see um, how it is calculated, how land cover change is included in this framework and how it is recommended to, uh, to calculate this indicator uh, with default data and methodology. Of course, each country then can uh, tailor this to their realities and available information. We will talk about this later. So the, the default data for, for uh, analyzing land cover and land use changes, this is a, a key indicator because land use changes, uh, of course, affect degradation. We talked about this a few slides before. And the default data is the European Space Agency um, data on land cover. The good thing about this data is that you have land cover maps for many years. So to see land cover changes, you need to have two land cover maps to be able to compare them. And these two maps need to be comparable too. Uh, for example, for IAS, we have a great land cover, but we, it's only for one moment. So we would need another land cover to see changes in time. Um, this is the default data. So it has many categories, this map, these, these products. And this needs to be regrouped into the C seven UNCCD categories. So first you need to regroup these categories and create a land cover map, for example, for your base uh, year, which is 2001. And then for 2018, for example, <clears throat> you do the same, and then you see what happened, uh, what things change. As, as you can see, the for IAS at this scale, this data set, which has a 300 meter resolution, is not very informative. So basically, I didn't put no uh, 
when we do the exercise, we can see with more detail these, uh, ma these maps. I didn't put the references, but it's mostly arable land, co cultivated land, cropland, <clears throat> and some grasslands using the uh, ESA maps. Once you compare these two maps, you obtain a land cover transitions map. So as you can see, there are almost no transitions in areas between these two uh, years using this data. Only here we can see some uh, grassland loss or cropland loss. And then you analyze this and, and you uh, obtain, this is all using drains.earth, no? So then you have this matrix where you can see which uh, land cover types change how much, uh, which are the areas that change, for example, from grassland to cropland, et cetera. And then to obtain a like, degradation map using this indicator, you need to define which of these land cover tra transitions are positive and are negative. So for example, and this is what this matrix is about, for example, here, converting a grassland to cropland is seen as a positive uh, change. But you, you can actually change this. No, it's very easy to change it, says I will show you in trends.earth how to change this. Or you can use your own data sets. If you have land covers, for example, for Turkey, we have Korean um, land cover also, which has many years and, and uh, better resolution. <coughs> we could use that or any other land cover that uh, you consider more appropriate. But you need to define for, or, for your area which transitions are positive and which transitions are negative. Um, in general, uh, going from forest to any other land cover type is negative, for example. Then, so then you change this map into your, from this map, you can obtain this map, which is the land cover degradation map, in which from all these categories, you only have <clears throat> three, whether it is degrading, stable, or improving. And you can calculate, you can calculate the percentage and the area of, uh, that is degrading or not. So as you can see, for IH basing, using this default data methodology wouldn't be very informative. Um, okay, so now let's move to the second indicator, which is land productivity dynamics. We will, uh, after the live presentation, we will work more on this. <clears throat> we will see other alternatives. But let me just introduce that briefly what we mean by land productivity and land productivity trends, land productivity dynamics. There are many different um, subtle differences among all of these terms. <coughs> Basically, what we, uh, what we want to see are long-term changes in, land pro in, in vegetation productivity. <coughs> and this is, um, to measure this, we use for example, the normalized different vegetation index, which is a satellite derived index that is based on how plants differentially uh, reflect different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have the near infrared and the red, and depending on whether vegetation is healthy or stressed, they reflect these uh, parts of the um, electromagnetic spectrum differently. Also, if you have more vegetation, you will have a higher NDVI. <clears throat> and this is how it is, um, it's a normalized difference of these two variables. And uh, NDVI is, is used as a proxy for many different uh, vegetation properties. Uh, it's not necessarily exactly net primary, primary productivity, but it's a very good proxy and this has been studied and used and uh, for many years and it's very well established. <clears throat> and why is productivity important? Well, it, when what is productivity? Productivity is related to um, the carbon that is fixed by plants. So it has a lot of implications for food security, for climate change, etc. In general, if you have more NDVI, you have more productivity, you have more greenness, you have more vegetation, more healthy, and more abundant vegetation. So 
what we can do with satellite images is to go back in time and analyze time series of NDVI so that we can see what, is, what has been happening, for example, for the last 20 years. Has there been an increase or a decrease? And for this, we have, for example, this data set from uh, MODIS, which is really good and, and, and available and easy to, to use, <clears throat> in which we have um, data for every 16 days on NDVI and also on other vegetation indexes. It has a two, 250 meter spatial resolution. And per year, in one year, since it is, we have one image every 16 days, actually it's a composite, we choose the best available pixel in those 16 years. So for, uh, since we have a, a map every 16 days, for one year, we get 23 composites. I'm sorry. <coughs> okay. So with this data, once we analyze it, we will see that uh, more in depth. Um, we can derive different sub-indicators. So we have 23 uh, um, values per year, and then we have many years. No? So we can analyze this time series of NDVA uh, data in different ways. And for, LEN, for LDN and for this particular indicator, which is land productivity dynamics, dynamics there are three sub-indicators. One is trajectory, the other one is state, and the other one is performance. Now we will see what these are about. And combining these three sub-indicators, you obtain a final indicator of land productivity dynamics. So what is trajectory? As we were um, saying, for this is, for example, a, a year. Data of NDVA data for one year. So we have 23 uh, um, data points, for example, for one pixel or one area. And we need to summarize these 23 uh, values into one uh, value, which is usually the annual mean at least it is what is used in trends.earth. Um, for example, you can average this or you can obtain other, um, other metrics, but let's think that we average this and we obtain an annual mean. So for each year, we will have one value of a DVI. And trajectory, what trajectory is about, is about fitting a linear regression to this time series so here we have time, and here we have the annual mean of NDVI, and we fit a linear regression. We analyze its um, significance because we need to see if, if this increase is actually significant or not, or if the decrease is significant or not in statistical terms. That's why we use the Mankendall trend test. <clears throat> and if we, if if this uh, trend is positive and is significant, then we say that there is improvement. If not, if it is negative, it is declining, and if it is not uh, significantly different from zero, if the slope is, is, is not different from zero, it means that it is stable. And like this, we obtain this, uh, this map of a trajectory. The second sub-indicator is state. State <coughs> is related to a comparison, is related now, is a comparison of two periods of time. So you need to define these two periods of time first, which is your baseline and which, your, which is your target period. For example, in this example, the baseline is from 2000 to 2012 and the target period is from 2013 to 2015. So then you classify your data in percentiles and you characterize whether in, in your target and your baseline period in which of these percentiles uh, your mean and DVI falls and you make the difference and if this difference is higher or equal to it's positive and higher of, uh, to two, then you classify this pixel as improving 
If it is uh, lower than minus two, it is potential degradation. And if it is between plus one and minus one, there is no change. So you obtain another map in which instead of with trajectory, we, we were looking at long-term change, whether there was an increase or a decrease. With the state, we are comparing the last uh, three days with the rest of the year because uh, maybe there is a, a change that is only happening in the last, for example, three years, and with the long-term trend with trajectory, you will not see it. So this is why this sub-indicator is also uh, useful to characterize land productivity changes. And finally, the third sub-indicator is performance. We said that state was a temporal comp comparison, performance is a spatial comparison. And the idea of performance is very interesting because it's trying to compare a, a specific area, so let's think of this as pixels, to other pixels which have similar characteristics in terms of soil, in terms of land cover, and compare and DVI in these two different places. Why? Because we would consider that a, a, the maximum NDVI we see in all the places with similar categories it's a, it's a proxy for the potential of that type of land, uh, the, the, the potential for productivity. And if in your pixel you have a very uh, a lower value than that, then uh, your area is degrading and could give more in terms of productivity. So that is the basic idea of performance. So you need to first classify, classify your area in terms of land cover and soil units and uh, now again, you, you see the distribution of NDVI, you, you find the 19th percentile because sometimes the maximum could be uh, an outlier, so just in case, but let's think of this as a, a, the maximum productivity that that type of land can achieve, and you compare it to your observed productivity in your pixel. So if this performance is lower than 0 0.5, your area is potentially degraded, and this is how you classify this. So how do we obtain this final land productivity dynamic map? Okay, and this is just the methodology that is implemented in terms of Earth. There are other ways of uh, also obtaining these land productivity dynamic maps that has five categories, as you can see. In the map, you cannot see them because in, in IAS Basin, most of it is uh, improving. And also because recently trends.earth changed the color palette for, to make it for colorblind people, but it's very difficult for not colorblind people to see the differences. Um, but okay, let's see how we obtain these five categories, categories which are, we were, uh, until now we were talking about improvement, stable and degradation. Three or two categories because with performance you only obtain two categories. Combining these three sub-indicators, you can characterize land as improving, stable, declining, and these two new categories which are stable but stressed and early signs of decline. And these are uh, related to state and performance indicators. So if you have improvement, how do you read this uh, table? So if you have improvement in trajectory for one uh, pixel or one area, you have improvement in trajectory, you have improvement in state, and you have stable performance, you classify it as improvements in these three classes map or as improvements in this uh, five classes map. But let's take a look at these two. If you have stable trajectory, that means there are no changes in the long-term trend. Now, the, 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 when you fit a linear regression, the slope is not different from zero. Let me check the time. Yeah, okay. So we have <clears throat> stable trajectory. We have stable uh, state. So in the last years, there is no change with respect to the baseline. But we have degradation in terms of performance. What does this mean? This means that this, could be, this pixel could uh, perform better, could have higher productivity, for example, if it were managed differently or because we know that our other areas with the same land cover and the same soil type uh, have higher productivity. 
So you classify this as stable, but stressed. For early signs of decline, as you can see, it's related to state because you have a stable trajectory, a stable performance, but degradation in state, meaning that the last years, the period that you define as target, you saw degradation. So the, the decline is very recent, so it's early signs of decline. Okay, so this is how you obtain this um, this map of land productivity dynamics using trends of earth um, methodology. And this could be used, for example, as part of the biophysical assessment in land use planning. And finally, the very challenging indicator, which is changes in soil organic carbon. We saw land cover change, land productivity dynamics, and changes in soil organic carbon. So basically what we want is to compare two periods, two, two moments in time regarding soil organic carbon, which is a key indicator because it's related to many uh, functionalities of the soil <clears throat> and productivity. And of course, all these uh, indicators are related. Uh, but uh, this indicator is very important. The problem is that it is very challenging. All the people who work in, in, in studying soils will know what I'm meaning by this because uh, soil organic carbon data is usually um, a legacy data, data, for example, that covers long periods of time. For example, in Argentina, uh, our soil organic carbon map has da data from the 70s until now. So this is a 50 year uh, <laughs> data set and you make only one map with all of that data. So how do you, do you um, measure changes in soil organic carbon? It's very challenging. Um, but so which is the approach that is um, recommended for this? A combined approach between soil or car organic carbon data and land cover changes. Because we know that the land cover that for it in general, of course, for us, for everything, there are exceptions. If you um, change from a forest to a grassland or to a cultivated land, there will be a decrease in soil organic carbon data. So combining, combining soil organic carbon data and land cover change data, you can obtain <coughs> the uh, degradation map based on soil organic carbon. Um, but as you can see, there isn't, uh, it is also not very informative uh, for IASH because well, you are using global data and, uh, and it's also always very related to your land cover change map. So how do we combine in LDN framework these three indicators? So land cover, productivity, and soil organic carbon change. We have these three maps and we need to obtain one map that allow us to calculate this, which is the proportion of land that is degraded over total land area. This is the indicator for the SDG, uh, for the target, for LDN target in SDG 15. So there is only one indicator, which is the 15.3.1 indicator. And this indicator is a number. It's actually not a map. It's just a number, which is the proportion of land that is degraded over total land area. And with this methodology, we are calculating this using a map, which is actually very useful for land use planning and also for management, because we need to know where the degradation is happening. But of course, there are other ways to estimate this number without actually mapping the relation. And for the combination of these three indicators, the one out, all out principle is used. That means if, if for a given pixel, one indicator says there is degradation, then in the final map, it will be degradation. <clears throat> and you obtain the final map of, for, of this indicator. And you can calculate then which is the percentage of area that is degraded, which, for example, for IH basin is um, seven square kilometers, which is only 0.6%. Uh, Using this methodology, if you use another methodology, you will obtain very different results. And this is what, where 
us as experts, as planners, we need to use uh, our expertise, our knowledge to actually um, find the, the most uh, useful data and the one that makes more sense and is uh, better for our study area. So now, um, Trends of Earth, the Trends of Earth gives you the, um, the possibility of not using global data for certain indicators. And, and it is very useful, uh, very easy to use. And what do I mean by Trends of Earth? Well, it, is a, it was specifically designed as a decision support tool for reporting SDG 15.3.1, and it operates as a free, free plugin to QGIS. And it also uh, uses Google Earth Engine uh, computing power and data. So we are kind of now looking at an example of using uh, some tools that we have already seen in other webinars, QGIS and Google Earth Engine. So <clears throat> this, just before we move to the, um, the demonstration, uh, this um, trends.earth was developed by Conservation International um, with a G Jeff pr a project that was about enabling um, the use of uh, satellite information, making it easier. You will see that you don't need to know much about GIS or Google Earth Engine to use it. It's just a few clicks and you get your maps. So Cesar, I will stop sharing if you are over there. Yeah. Yep. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Or good afternoon for you. Um, okay. I will share. Let me move my screens around. So I can put participant and the chat. Okay. Can you see my QCIS? Good. Okay, we'll turn off my camera so I have more speed in my screen. Um, so here is a QCIS. This is a project we did a we started with QCIS in, in one of the webinars, and in the second webinar, we did this Trends Air, uh, sorry, the Google Earth Engine, where here, for example, we calculated this NDVI uh, layer for IAS for August 2020. So this is a project we have in QCIS. We are going to add uh, now some layers from Trends Earth. As Ingrid mentioned, okay, where does Trends Earth comes from? Uh, here, there is a web page. If you just look for Trends Earth in your browser, you will be taken to the main uh, Trends Earth web page, where you have a lot of information about all the things that uh, Trends Earth can do and how to how to use it. Uh, there are some tutorials and everything. So it's a very well documented. It's also, I don't know, some languages. Uh, so this is uh, the web page. And how do you get this into QGIS? Well, this is a QGIS plugin. So basically, if you come to the where all the plugins uh, for QGIS are, which is just here on top. Um, you will be able to find a uh, trend set. So basically coming to plugins, you get this window and here, if you search for trends earth, you can find the plugin and simply, simply uh, install. I already have it installed. So I only can reinstall it or uninstall it, but you will have an install button and it's as simple as that. To use it, it's also not very complicated. Um, there are here, once you install it, you will get in your QCIS this nice set of toolbox. 
uh, for example, this fir first one, the setting tool, is where you can register. You have to register with a login uh, just to, to uh, have a, uh, your email in the system because every time you send a task, as Ingrid mentioned, this software is connected to Google Earth Engine. So the, the computations are not done in your computer. They are done in, in the cloud. So after you send a task to, to produce a map, then they will send you an email telling you that the task is ready uh, and, and you can proceed to download. Here they have an indicator calculator, which is very, very simple. So far they have this uh, land degradation indicator and also urban change and land consumption indicators and also some tools about carbon and biomass restoration that they are developing. Uh, we are going to go to the first one, to the land degradation indicator. And here you can calculate these three sub-indicators that English just uh, show. You can calculate productivity. Uh, for example, the process is very simple. Uh, you can choose NDVI, which is in the land trend productivity. And then here you have all the options for this uh, sub-indicator of land productivity that English mentioned. You have trajectory, which can be the NDVI trend. You can choose your time period. For example, you can go to 21 to 2019, if you like. Um, also here there are an extra settings, um, which are the use of different methods to calculate trends. Uh, I think after my presentation, Ingrid will continue with this, but here is the bottom in, in Trends Earth, where you can include some weather information to your NDVI uh, trend calculation. There are different data sets that you can use for this. Then is the performance. You can also choose the, the years you want to do the calculation. And for the state, which is the other sub-indicator, you can choose your initial period and comparison period. So this is all the setting you have for this indicator. And then you simply say, okay, where? Where do you want to calculate it? I have here my IAS uh, shapefile. So I can just include my IAS shapefile uh, click next, and then I can say, okay, this is land productivity for IASH from uh, 2001 to 2019. This is a task name, so I can identify the, the, the calculation I want Trends Air to do for me, and then I just click calculate. By doing this, I have submitted a productivity task to Google Earth Engine. So instead of going to Google Earth Engine, uh, which is the software we saw in the last webinar where you can do really a lot of calculus and complex things, this is a way, a simple way to connect with menus, QGIS and Google Earth Engine. Okay, where did this task went? So I send the task and here I have this uh, sign of a cloud with an arrow. This is the view Google Earth Engine task icon. So if I click here, I will have here a window of all the tasks I sent in the last 14 days. If I put refresh, for example, here, I have this land productivity, I asked 2001, which is already been sent to the server and is running in the system. So here it tells me the task is being run in Google Earth Engine, and I need to refresh the list and wait until it says finish. Okay, it's already finished, so it was a very quick process to do all these uh, three sub-indicators. Once it's finished, I can download the result. Let me add it here, run productivity. IAS 0.1.19. If I press save, it will download it from the 
Google Engine Repo. And now I have here my, uh, let me turn off the NDI, okay. I have the maps that Ingrid was uh, talking and was calculating before. So the state, sub-indicator, the productivity performance, and the trajectory uh, sub-indicators. So they already get loaded into your QGIS with the legend and all the, the data that you need. Great. Here also, if we go back to this land degradation indicator, here you can also calculate land cover and the soil organic carbon uh, sub-indicator. Uh, land cover has seen the show, it's also very spread, uh, straightforward. You just choose your target and your final year. And you can edit, if you are using the ESA, the Space Agency ESA land cover, you can edit the definition. So you have a lot of different categories in this land cover, but you can say, okay, this category goes to other land, this is a wetland because at the end we need to put everything in the seven classes that the UCCD is using for reporting. And here in the second tab, you also have this table that will determine which land cover changes are, are considered degradation or not in your area. So for example, if going from a cropland to a grassland can be improved, or degradation or can be neutral. You can change this as you like. And for your specific case, you can define which of these changes is positive, negative, or neutral. And then the use is very simple. You can give just the same area study area and running in the system is very quick. Uh, we have also the soil organic carbon indicator which basically is operates in the same way. Uh, there are some parameters here in advance that you can manually introduce or you can use the full uh, global data for that. Uh, but anyway, here there is at the end uh, one folder icon that says load data. Here, basically, you can import your own data. So if you have a better land cover uh, from different time periods in a better quality, you can come to land cover here and you can add, if you have it in raster or in a polygon, uh, you can add your own land cover, you can edit the classes definition, so you can put your own data here to do the calculations. The same goes for soil organic carbon and the same goes for productivity. If you use one another method like Ingrid will show afterward to calculate trends in land productivity, you can just simple, simply come and add your raster or your polygon with this category, one for declining, two for early signs. So you just add it here in the system and you can use your own uh, data for the calculation, which is totally recommended instead of using global data, especially for small areas like this. I already did all the, have all the, um, the maps here, Ingrid produced, so this will be the ESA land cover for 2001, and this is for 2018 and then I have the land cover degradation map. So once I have my three sub-indicators, I can totally come to this final part, which says calculate final SDG. This already, if I already calculated indicator, Transfer will, will automatically identify which are the different sub-indicators and already add it here to the menu. So I only need to add the study area, define here, um, I can come to IAS data, put it a name, SDG for IAS. And save it. And this will create different things. It will, this will create few maps but it also will create this table that Ingrid was mentioning. It is an Excel table 
that contains um, all of the information. So here it is the um, land productivity dynamic maps that you get with the global data. As I mentioned before, this is a very, very coarse resolution global data for the area. I think I have um, some of the original colors. I can load to the map, okay? So we can see it's mostly uh, productivity is increasing, stable. There are some places where there are early signs of decline and some places which is decline. I'm sure if you put a better land cover and a better soil map, you will get a, quite a different view. And here is the final indicator. As we mentioned before, you get these maps at the end of the analysis, but you also get, which is very interesting. Uh, let me just oops, open the table. Okay, there is an Excel table here. Okay, so you get this nice table with uh, information about the final numbers of what is uh, degrading, what is improving in the in the area, and also you get some analysis indicator by indicator. So, for example, of the areas with different productivity trends. Uh, so, areas that are, for example, uh, in this transition, which are uh, in early decline, you can see the land cover distribution of these areas. You have information about soil organic carbon changes, the changes in land cover. So you can see, for example, that grassland being converted to cropland uh, in two square kilometers. And you can find here a lot of information of the different indicators already very, very easy to uh, statistics, uh, all nice presently in an Excel file. And also for UNCCD reporting, you need some tables and these tables are automatically produced in the, here in the last tab. So you can uh, upload them directly to the report. Basically, this is the, the information that you get uh, by using Trends Earth. As you can see, it's a very, very simple tool, very intuitive. Uh, it also has some extra buttons over here. Uh, it has all the raw data, so you can also use it to download uh, data that is stored in, in Google Earth Engine. There are here different, uh, as you can see, indicators, precipitation data, soil moisture, soil organic carbon for different time periods. And you can simply get one of these and you specify your area and you can download the whole data set from, from here. So it's, only, it's also good to obtain some, some data. This is of course global data, but uh, for some variables, if you don't have local data, this is very, very helpful. And, and at large scale is also, also good. Also here you have another button where you can plot data. So here you can run different plots. There are NDVI. You can choose, we can try to do one. This should go very quickly. Uh, so you can choose one area and try to do a plot about the trend. So you can see how the, the trend is going. Uh, perhaps it takes a while with my internet connection. Okay, let's see, refresh list. Okay, it already finished, so I can download and I get here, for example, this is an average NDVI uh, time series analysis for the whole IAS uh, area. So this is why the map is, is green, because as you can see, 
For the, for the whole IAS basin, there is a positive trend and uh, it's going up. Okay, so there are different, different tabs and buttons you can uh, try. Uh, Ingrid, I think, will show now different methods that you can include in your calculation. This will totally yield different maps. So it's, to, it's very advisable that you explore a little bit more on what are the results you get using different parameters. As I mentioned before here, instead of just the NDVI, you can use the pixel restraint or the water use efficiency. And you have here some uh, climatic data sets that you can put into the calculation. Uh, IAS is quite a small basin, so for some of these huge uh, global uh, data that you get from this weather, weather product, it may get uh, very big pixels, but uh, you can try and quickly see how, how that will, will change your map or not. Then if you see there is a linkage, you can try using your own data building a more a high resolution approach. So I think this concludes my quick uh, demo on, on Trends Earth plugin. You have the web page, you can Google it, and also in your QGIS, you can download the plugin and use it very quickly with the data is already available in Trends Earth. But remember, if you have your own data of better quality, use that and you will get always a better result, especially in, in very small areas. Okay, thanks a lot. And if there are any questions. Uh, there was a question Mustafa asked about organic carbon data. Um, Mustafa, I don't know if you would like to, if it is enough with what we answered in the chat or you would uh, like to ask something okay. else? I see it. Yeah, this is global data. You can, you can, for example, get this. Actually, I wrote my question. I think you, you may respond to my question. You can ask your question verbally as well. So, okay. Organic carbon maps. We, we, we collect soil samples and we used other parameters when preparing such a map we base our analysis on organic carbon content in the soil are there different parameters to calculate it are there different methodologies to calculate the soil organic uh, content of this uh, the organic carbon content of the soil sorry Could you hear me? Yeah, well, in actually the the indicator in in this context is changes in soil organic carbon. So it's even more difficult. <clears throat> As I said, this is a very <clears throat> different uh, indicator to calculate because soil organic carbon uh, data, it's usually uh, legacy data. So uh, when you build your, your, if you have data on soil organic carbon, that of course you first, we will talk about this also in, in our next webinar in which we will talk about digital soil sampling and how you can predict soil organic carbon for other places in which you didn't measure it and which other parameters you consider, you usually consider. Nowadays, with all the machine learning algorithms that allow us to use many variables, we can um, make these models to predict soil organic carbon, including many different parameters from the texture of the soil, the productivity, the NDVI, uh, and, <clears throat> and as much variables as you have available, you can use them in your model, of course, in, in within a, a that they make some sense for, for predicting soil organic carbon. Um, but in this context, as Cesar just said, in Trends Earth, and as I put in the chat, you use this uh, soil grids map of soil organic carbon, but for example, you could use the uh, global soil organic carbon map that of FAO, which is available and you can download it and also use it. 
as inputs or your own soil organic carbon. And you, you use this data of soil organic carbon in this context as a reference because it, it, you usually do not have two periods of two soil organic carbon data for two times. So the, the change is in time you evaluate with land cover change data. And you use your soil organic carbon data as a reference to see, uh, to have a reference on, on the, the value, the magnitude of these changes in terms of soil organic carbon data. But it will not make a much, a, much of a difference, uh, uh, unfortunately, if uh, you use different soil organic carbon data for, for this. Uh, it it has land, land change uh, data has more impact in this indicator than the soil organic carbon data itself. There is a lot of room for improvement regarding this indicator. Yes. Ben, e, ben şimdi şunu söylemek istiyorum. Organic well, carbon. If I may, soil organic carbon is to be measured. Is to be measured, not anticipated. It has to be measured, not anticipated. And as we measure the SOC, we have to look at the depth of the soil, the climate conditions, the vegetation, type of vegetation. We have to look them, look at them all. And geological, geomorphological structure of the soil is to be looked at as well. So a program cannot just be based on the satellite images. We cannot just calculate a chemical thing basing ourselves on a satellite image. And secondly, if we have a previous SOC map, then we don't have to uh, measure the uh, carbon once again. Well, if the, if the map is relatively recent, then we don't have to measure it once again. If we have measurements at every 250 meters as a spacing, for example, if we have a recent organic carbon map, then we can just use it. Use it. But I know this is not enough. And the, the live soil, the viable soil layer should also be included as a parameter. So lots of parameters are to be used, how to be used. We have FAO carb carbon map. I know I was engaged in the production of that map. I very well remember those periods. And we got included in that project with 8,000 samples from Turkey but um, 78 million hectares of land, you cannot just cover all those lands with 8,000 samples from Turkey, I know that. So the 1,800,000 is the scale of the map, I believe. So what I'm trying to say is, we can't just base ourselves on a satellite image when trying to calculate the soil organic carbon. This is why I wanted to pose my questions to the speakers. Well, the presentations were very well, by the way, thank you. But I was curious whether you uh, had a different method in mind in order to measure the carbon. Uh, I just uh, wondered whether you, ha a, 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 you had a brand new methodology in mind to calculate the carbon. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mostafa. No, of course, yeah, soil organic carbon needs to be measured in the soil, and and all, as you just said, the global soil organic carbon map of FAO is based on soil samples, and as so is the soil grids uh, soil organic carbon map. But if you need to map it in a continuous area, you need to somehow interpolate it. You need to interpolate these data points. Actually, if you measure it in one point, in one specific area, which is where you took the sample, the soil sample, uh, soil organic carbon will, will varies a lot, and, and, and it can, if you measure it again in 100 meters away, it will have a very different value. And so you need to consider, it's impossible to have enough uh, to measure the whole grand wall-to-wall -wall approach. It would be great to do that, but it's um, impractical and impossible at the moment. Maybe um, someone, not me, will come up with a better methodology, quicker, cheaper, and easier to measure soil organic carbon. And this is why it is so important to, when we make maps of soil organic carbon, which um, can use satellite information for making better predictions or not, but you don't only use satellite information to 
to um, improve the predictions, you uh, also include other types of information because, for example, maybe you can use um, soil or geological information that was uh, obtained not from satellite derived information. The idea of using all these other variables is to make better predictions because you can interpolate your data only by using spatial autocorrelation methods like Kriging, for example, normal simple Kriging, and you just interpolate your data and predict your data uh, using this information, the spatial autocorrelation information, or you can uh, use other methods that, for example, you can consider, for example, there is, if there is another land cover, if there is another soil type, if you have all this information, you expect that you will make better predictions using this ancillary information. But of course, the predictions are based on soil carbon data, as you said, that is, uh, you need to measure from the soil. And what I, I want to say is that this is a great uh, issue to discuss, and, and, and it also highlights the importance of uh, uncertainty, of mapping uncertainties when we map um, uh, soil organic carbon and considering this because uh, it gives us an idea of how far we might be from reality. And, 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 we, and sometimes this is not considered and all these new techniques are, uh, allow us to, the, to measure uncertainty also and accompany maps of soil organic carbon with uncertainty. Cesar, you were trying to say something? Yes. <laughs> I was also like to, to speak about the, an answer to the question. Um, I was thinking because the, the idea of this indicator is that is that you can be able to measure the change in time of soil organic carbon to know if you are losing or you are gaining soil organic carbon. So the, the idea of the indicator is very simple. Which is hard is to make it <laughs> to make it to, to know what is really happening. So this is the, the most easy approach that was proposed by, by UNCCD. Say, okay, we can start with this map and, and we can start. You actually are looking at changes in land cover, not soil organic carbon. We we put there the Shisok map of FAO for many projects, and you get the same result because the, this is only map of one, one period, and then you see the exchange in land cover. But I guess uh, for some countries or for some places where you monitor soil organic carbon or you, you have old measurements and new measurements, the, the best approach will be to make two different maps. One map of a previous uh, year, with measurements, I don't know, from all the, the samples you can get until 2000, and one new map with all the, the newest samples. And then you can put here in, in this tool the, the two maps that you prepare uh, with, with soil samples of different times. And in that way, you can try to estimate, make a better estimate of the change in, in soil organic carbon. But you need to, the only way of really accurately do it is, is that if you, if you have a monitoring system where you measure soil organic carbon content every five or 10 years in the, in the, in the land. For a country, it's sometimes very hard to do because it's costly and as we say, we need a lot of sample, but for a small basins, you, you maybe can. Yep, go ahead. Cesar, thank you very much for all the nice information that you have provided. But the thing is, the phosphate or potassium in the soil, what, can we also calculate them this way? No. The carbon is going to be used in organic matter calculation in a way. So especially when we are making recommendations about fertilizer application, we are using organi organic carbon as well uh, because we need a parameter in soil which will not be changing in the soil. The nitrogen, nitrogen will be changing very much in the soil under different temperature circumstances, but you have to find something which will not be variable a lot. This is why we are basing ourselves on organic carbon when we are recommending fertilizers to the people. So the thing is, 
if he can just benefit from the past data and also satellite image and if he can end in a map then this is so nice and it, it, we can use it for the profit for, for the productivity indicator as well and also when identifying the nitrogen uh, amount in the soil we can use a similar tool i believe so what i'm trying to say is what is what is the resolution of the map that we are going to get from this tool what is the accuracy rate uh, using this tool what is the resolution scale what is the rate of resolution that of the map that we are going to draw from this tool i'm not just trying to reject or do anything i'm just interested can i can i intervene emra is saying Hakka is saying can i intervene okay please can i hear me can you hear me says uh, emra yes uh, uh. Mustafa, just to clarify, if I may, there are UNCCD prepared videos about each and every indicators indicators presented today and about the resolutions of the maps. There, is, there are these uh, videos of the UNCCD. But the thing is, these global data in trans, trans Earth the things about soil organic carbon and the FAO map and the soil grid, these are all global data. These are all global data. And as Cesar said, they generally uh, suggest uh, the reduction and the increase in the carbon. This is the idea behind this this indicator and as, as a country as a country which are which is a party to many conventions uh, we are obliged to do reporting about reduction and increase in the soil organic carbon and the ultimate idea of these uh, indicators was to identify the baseline of the carbon of the of the countries at the beginning this is why from now on when you do reporting as a government as a country you are going to see the differences in in the trends when it comes to organic carbon but first of all you you have to see the baseline right this is why fao has this uh, global soc map it is it is acting as a as a baseline and it was prepared as 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 a baseline and in soil grit the soil grit map the scale is one but well, well, i couldn't understand the scale i'm sorry but I, I i know about the scales of those maps i was involved in the sampling process of those projects that you are mentioning but in general those maps use of those maps in a local in a small area as i ayash may not be so possible i'm afraid but those data those global data and maps can be can accompany the regional data, local data from, from IASH. This is how you can make use of the global data. Global data can accompany the local data. Well, soil grid or uh, FAO SOC map, uh, these are global data and they cannot be uh, used as a standalone data in IASH basin. Even if they're, they are used, they will not be giving detailed data to you, unfortunately. That is why global data have to be enriched with global with the regional and local data this is what we're trying to do in this in this project we are trying to draw some local regional data uh, from the labs laboratories as well please do not consider that global data will be used as a standalone data in in this project they will be just acting as the baseline global data and they'll be they'll be suggesting certain trends in increase and reduction in in the soil organic carbon in certain regions but they'll not be helping us with an actual uh, with the with the very planning process no local regional data will be required data from the region from the field uh, will be so much important that is it i think says cesar would you like to say something yes yeah yes. yeah no just a quick comment before i i leave ingrid with her last presentation uh, but i no i wanted to comment on that thing of the scale i mean this is just a tool uh, and and most of this as haki say was thought for country reporting so the idea of this is something that can be implemented by every country at a country level so it's very high scale 
and that's what I constantly try to mention that if you are in a small watershed, you need to put uh, different data, your own data, and and do it differently. You can use these tools to, to help you with the technical part of mixing the satellite layers or the maps that you produce, but you need to use your own local data for, for such a small area. But okay, I think Ingrid has another presentation and we already yes. very late. Sorry. Yes, I should continue. I will not say actually, anything. Now we will, actually, now we will see, <clears throat> for example, that an alternative way to, um, to measure productivity changes and uh, using an other methodology. <clears throat> and as we were just saying, also, Trends of Earth gives you the, the possibility to upload your own data at the scale that you want to, to work with. So the idea is to present this tool, for example, uh, but you can not necessarily use default global data. You can use trends.earth and use your own data, especially for land cover and, and, and soil organic carbon. So <clears throat> I will continue so that we finish. I think we should be finishing by now, but anyway, uh, I think it's very good to have these discussions. It's actually the best part. Oh, <clears throat> I should go. Oh. <clears throat> Come on, sorry for this. It's good to remember all we have seen. <laughs> I put the, the slide we were supposed to start with, but I don't know why. Okay. Now we are arriving. Land productivity trends. Why are we focusing on this indicator? Well, because it's it's the one that in general in many countries uh, is the one that is the most informative one <clears throat> and since we saw la la in solar organic carbon and land cover changes are very associated for reporting or on, with this methodology um, if you if you make a change of for example the way you are managing land but you do not change land cover that will not be reflected in these uh, indicators. Of course, for LDN, these are just some indicators proposed for monitoring and reporting at national scale. And we need to learn from this and, and, and change it. And also many other indicators need to be uh, included in our analysis. Other types of indicators uh, at national level, at regional level regarding other um, social economic indicators, stress reduction indicators. So uh, this can is not just the only thing that needs to be that has to be reported. And the idea of the indicators is to help us, not just reporting it, uh, is to help us uh, address land degradation and make some changes. So we we should always remember that. So. We, for example, we were talking about NDVI. Is NDVI the only vegetation index that we can use? No, there are other vegetation indexes, for example, <clears throat> such as the enhanced vegetation index and the soil adjusted vegetation index that could be more informative for um, a particular region or area. For example, the soil adjusted, the study, the, the soil adjusted vegetation index, um, it's better, it's more sensitive uh, when the vegetation cover is low. And on the contrary, AB is better in areas with dense vegetation. And these are available, these indexes are available and we can use them. So uh, this is another way of also of improving. Sorry, I think someone huh? has the microphone on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, that is 
that is well, one one thing I wanted to talk about. Another thing is how you we talked about the twenty three values yeah. per year and how we um, integrate this, how we summarize this annual information. Well, we are in trends earth. You you calculate the annual mean, but you can calculate other metrics, which could be very informative to and address different things. For example, with land with uh, NDVI data or AV data or SAVI data, you can calculate, for example, different phenological metrics such as the the length of the growing season, the rate of growth, the rate of senescence, the 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 time where it starts. Maybe there are changes in the in, in long-term changes of when the growing season is starting, maybe it is delaying or be starting before. You can also uh, characterize the seasonality and see if there are changes in seasonality over the years. Uh, for example, instead of calculating the annual mean, you calculate the coefficient of variation. And there is also another index that is called SP, that is the Annual Ecosystem Services Productivity Index, which is the, um, it considers the annual mean, the NDVI annual mean, and the coefficient of variation. It con considers both things. And here, for example, you can see these are different years, and here for the same NDVA data, NDVI data, if you calculate the annual mean, which is in red for every year, you get this uh, time series of annual means of NDVI. So there is a 17-year period here. And here, around 2011, there was a change from grassland shrublands to cultivated land. And the mean NDVI will not change that much between these two types of land cover. But the SP will capture more, we will be more uh, sensitive to this change in land cover or land use. And because it not only considers the annual mean, but it also considers the um, coefficient of variation within each year, the seasonality. Because cultivated areas may have the same annual mean, but they will have a higher seasonality uh, than grasslands. So, for example, instead of using time series of, of annual means, you can use time series of SP, which would give you more information. And we did that. We did that for Argentina. We did that for Upper Sakaria Basin. For example, here is a paper in which we compare different methodologies, different analytical approaches, uh, and how very different results you get, depending with, even with the same data. You can use different data, but you also with the same data, if you use very, if you use different analytical approaches, for example, <clears throat> um, this, this column is using annual means and this column is using SP. And the rows correspond to different ways of characterizing the trends, different uh, analytical approaches. Everything is in the paper, we can discuss it, I would not bore you now about this. But the bottom line here is that even with the same data, with different analytical approaches, you will get very different results. And how important it is to, um, this, what we were discussing with SOC data, is valid for every indicator. These are, for example, these six maps for, uh, for IAS Basin. And you, as you can see, you get very, very different results. These are the three different methods. The long-term trend, we call the SWATI and the S-SWATI. Uh, these are ju just different ways of analyzing the data, which are all valid, but uh, which is the best? Well, this is the, the key question. Uh, for this, we need to validate maps. We need to ask experts. And for example, we also calculated a consensus map from these six different maps. Um, and as you can see, uh, a little bit more of area is degrading. It's almost uh, not 2%, it's 1.7%, 1, 1 but it is a bit more than we had seen with the other um, methodology. And also how 
you can uh, characterize the magnitude of these changes. Now we were talking about magnitude. It's not the same to say, oh, it's degrading, but if it is a very strong negative trend or if it is a light negative trend. So this is also an issue that is important to, to quantify the magnitude of the trend of the changes. This is what Cesar was talking about when he was showing uh, trends.f that also this is a big discussion in the academics or the academics of um, whether you are interested in distinguishing if uh, the negative trends are or positive trends are related to human induced changes or climate variability because Primary productivity is affected by many things, uh, water, light, temperature, and you need to uh, interpret variability using historical precipitation in information as a context. And however, uh, for LDN, it's important to, to measure degradation, whether it is human-induced or climate-induced. This is important maybe to analyze, of course, but it's not necessary uh, to disgregate. And also the climate correct correction methods that are used to um, include historical precipitation information in the analysis uh, will depend on this information. And if you have if the available information, the historical available information is not good, then you will have very bad results too. Um, I think we do not have time to, to go in detail on which of these methods. There is the residual trend analysis. Uh, here is a paper, the, the rain use efficiency, uh, trends of rain use efficiency, or you can calculate trends on water use efficiency. And here are the available data sets in trends.earth for uh, historical precipitation and evapotranspiration. And um, we saw how to obtain um, these land productivity dynamics maps. Remember when we were combining these three sub-indicators and we obtained this five class final map? Well, there are other ways also to obtain a land productivity dynamics map. This is, for example, the map for Sakaria Basin, for Upper Sakaria Basin using the, the JRC uh, simplified methodology. And you can read more on, on this, but in, in this methodology, another approach is taken, but you also obtain these five categories, no? early signs, including early signs of decline and stable but stressed. And also you can be creative and think of a methodology that better represents what is happening. And this is also something that I, I have to say always that uh, in line with, with what Mustafa was saying, no? we need um, field data to validate and to, to have a information that is actually represented what is going on in the ground. We, we cannot rely simply on satellite data, uh, not only for soil organic carbon data, but also for productivity. And we are making a, ve a, ve a very uh, um, simple association between um, positive trends are improving conditions. Is that always true? No, not necessarily. In this area, for example, I really like this picture from Hans-Peter Lineger. He um, is showing here in, uh, an in, uh, invasion of a, uh, of a woody species that, of course, you will see an, improve, an, an increase in NDVI, but this is not necessarily an improvement. Uh, because if uh, an invasive wooded species is invading everything and cattle cannot use it and biodiversity is uh, decreasing, then uh, even though you have a positive trend, this is not an uh, improvement in terms of land degradation. So we need to go to the field and we need to ask experts also their, uh, about their knowledge on, on, on the area. So to finalize this webinar, um, some final remarks. Let's not forget we are talking about uh, ELUP, about land use planning, and, and land use, integrated land use planning is a, a great way to balance environmental, economic, and social priorities, which all need to be taken into account also in LDN. 
And uh, what we need to focus is using the best information available, whether it is global or whether it is regional or whether it is national. Um, uh, let's use the best information that is available on land degradation status, but also land potential, socioeconomical data, and gender considerations, and to and optimize the spatial mix of possible interventions. And, and this is why ELUP is key to achieve LDN. And um, it is always important to emphasize the importance of multi-stakeholder participation for making these processes successful and useful. So that is uh, the end. Thank you very much. And I don't know if we have, I think we are already past 10 minutes. Well, we started also 10 minutes late, so I think we are okay with the time. Um, thank you very much. If there are any questions or comments, now is the time. Is there someone with a question, Mustafa? No question for now. Thank you very much to your colleagues for the presentations. As for the soil mapping, we are waiting for a more efficient webinar on soil mapping. Once we get that webinar, we will have more questions to ask. I guess the mic of the head of the department is still glitching. I guess there is no question. I'm trying to reach the head of the department through phone. I'll get back soon, very soon. Please wait, hold on. Thank you very much, Ingrid and Caesar, for these presentations. Thank you. Mustafa, you are making me be more scared and scared of the follow or the next webinar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Nice yeah. to be here, yeah. as always. I guess the head, the mic of the head is still glitching. I guess we can now end the session and the webinar. Thank you for participation. Hope to see you in the next webinar. I'd like to thank Kyal and Denise for the interpretation services. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>